Lee Vinsel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right, so you've co-authored a book dedicated to the idea that we need to revive our sense of the importance of maintenance and repair. But you spend the first half of the book arguing that one of the reasons that maintenance has been neglected is that we started spending all of our time thinking about innovation, even though all that emphasis on innovation ironically doesn't actually result in more real innovation. We'll talk about what this modern overemphasis on innovation looks like here in a minute. But to start, when did you first realize that maybe our focus on innovation isn't all it's cracked up to be? Um, it, it really came from like a frustration with the way people were talking about innovation. You know, I work in universities and university administrators just talk about innovation, innovation, innovation all the time. Um, and you also hear it in the business world, especially in the kind of Silicon Valley tech sector. So for us, it started with a, just a frustration with how empty the word had become. Uh, and then only later, um, my buddy made a joke. So Walter Isaacson's book, the, it was called The Innovators, How a Group of Hackers, Geniuses, and Greek Geeks Created the Digital Revolution. Um, that book came out, and my buddy Andy, who I wrote the book with, said we should write a, like, a, a counter volume, which would be called The Maintainers, How Bureaucrats, Standards Engineers, and Introverts Create Technologies That Kind of Work Most of the Time. And we played with that online, like on Twitter and blog posts and stuff, and it just kind of took on a life of its own. And then it was through kind of exploring that um, that di- that you know that dichotomy between the way people are talking about innovation and you know maintenance and repair that we started to see that you know the ma- that the way we talk about innovation has these dark sides. So I wouldn't say it was like an re- like immediate insight. It would really kind of came over time from thinking about these issues. Well, let's talk about this idea about the way we talk about innovation uh, at universities and businesses, even in the government. In the book, you make you make this point. It's important to distinguish between actual innovation and innovation speak. What's the difference between the two? Yeah, so actual innovation is the process of introducing new things or new processes, new business models, things like that. Um, and one of the reasons we want to make, you know, this distinction is because we think innovation is really important. You know, human life has really changed over the last 150 or 200 years with, you know, the rise of all these technologies like electricity and computing and, you know, we can go on and on. Um, but innovation speak, the, the, even the, our use of the word innovation didn't really start until after World War II. Um, and... Not only that, so we, we wanted to, we want to say like this way we've, we, we talk about innovation has a history. And if you, if you look at like some people argue that actual innovation slowed down since about 1970 or so. Um, and yet we've been talking about innovation more and more. Uh, and so it's not clear that talking about innovation is actually getting us innovation. And so that's one reason why this distinction is really important is to be clear that, you know, the kind of talk and hype is different from the thing. And, and just to be very clear about that. Well, in some of the, the stuff you hear today about innovation speak, it's like, we're going to innovate or we're going to disrupt. That, that's the kind of stuff you hear. And you're like, what exactly does that, what does that, what does that actually mean? Yeah, disruption is one of these things that started off with a very narrow, precise meeting in the early 1990s, and then it just becomes, you know, this hot buzzword uh, that people throw around that has no meaning, basically, you know. Um, And there's lots of other ones like agile and lean, um, you know, uh, all kinds of innovation, social innovation, social entrepreneurship. There's just this huge, like, bag of buzzwords. Design thinking, of course. Design yes. thinking. Yeah. yeah, design thinking. Yeah, that's another one. Well, I think you make this interesting point, sort of the history of this innovation speak, the way we talk about innovation. Before World War II, people didn't use the word innovate when they talked about technology. They used the word progress. And when when you hear progress, you think, okay, things get better, like our life gets better. And you, you and your co-author make this case that, yeah, like before World War II, like the technological advancements that we made, a lot of them, like they brought progress. Like they brought us out of poverty and increased uh, health, et cetera. Well, I mean, so you could, there's a tool that your your listeners can play around with called Google Ngram. It's N-G-R-A-M. And it allows you to track word use over time. It's just fun to throw in there like peanut butter and jelly or whatever and see when people started talking about that. But if you throw in progress in there, you can see that our use of the word progress actually starts going down in the late 1960s. 
you know? And I mean, that's the time of like Nixon and the Vietnam War, and there's all these environmental problems and the economy is like in the garbage. And people started kind of lost faith in progress, moral progress, that our society was getting better and better. And innovation almost becomes a substitution word. It's not saying, you know, it's not saying that society is going to progress necessarily. It's like technology is going to get better and somehow that's going to save us. Right. So there's, there was like a, there's been a decoupling between like innovate, like actual innovation and human progress before, like, you know, you get electricity that changes people's lives or indoor plumbing or antibiotics. That that's a game changer. But now it's like, okay, you have a new app on your smartphone. Does it really make that much of a difference? Totally. Yeah. And you see all these firms like Uber and Peloton and WeWork. And there's so many firms right now that are struggling to be profitable, right? And they're like app-driven, often app-driven things. And they're just not that big of a benefit to human life. You know, they smooth out some things that make some things more convenient. But it's not electricity. It's not the automobile. Um, it's not, you know, modern chemicals or whatever, right? It's not that big. But what happened? Like, why was there a decoupling, like, you'd, right, right around the 1960s of, like, technological innovation and and like what we call progress, like, th- our lives getting better? What do you think happened? So it's a really, there's huge debates in economics and history about this issue right now. Um, my take is that, you know, one way to put it is that we we kind of plucked all the low-hanging fruit in technology. And some of the biggest changes in technology were, and this is like the economist Robert Gordon argues, they came between 1870 and 1970. So you're talking about the car, electricity, the airlines, chemicals, uh, electronics industries, early computing, all these things, right? And then, you know, after 1970 or 1980, those things are not, improving that rapidly. So when we talk about innovation, a lot of times we're talking about cell phones and the internet, right? And I would never say that, though, I mean, right now you and I are talking over Skype and doing this interview remotely. And, you know, in higher ed today, because of COVID, we're running our classes over Zoom or whatever. I would never say that those things have not had some effect, but it's a very narrow band of human life. And then, you know, your toilet hasn't improved that much over the last 50 years or whatever, right? Like, there's a lot of areas of human life where things are pretty set and mature. And I think that's the issue, is that there's a lot of parts of our life that just haven't been changing that rapidly. Yeah, I think I've heard, like, this thought experiment when people ask, like, a hypothetical, like, would you rather give up, like, your iPad and your internet-connected devices or indoor plumbing, electricity, and antibiotics, concrete, concrete. Yeah, exactly. right? And you're like, yeah, I, I could, I would be fine without all this, like pretty much all the tech inventions from 2000 on. I'd be okay if I didn't have it. I mean, like Slack is nice to do business work over with, and even though you know, we can also talk about how a lot of these things are also distractions and actually interrupt our work too, right? So they're not always wins, but it's not that big of an improvement over email or the kinds of things we had in the nineties. You know, another point you, you guys make is that, well, so we, we, we want innovation, like, because we have this idea that new is better, um, but not necessarily. And so as a result, there's been these like industries that have built up. They're like innovation industries where they sell you the idea of innovation. Like walk us through some of these businesses that have grown up to sell us the idea of innovation. Yeah. So we highlight three in the, in the book. Um, I'll start with Clayton Christensen. He was a Harvard Business School uh, professor. He died a year or two ago now. And he's the guy who came up with the idea of disruptive innovation, or at least the term. He was actually borrowed the idea from an earlier economist. Um, and, you know, the idea of disruption is, the, is that some new innovation is going to, like, blow um, – an existing industry or technology out of the water. Like now we have Netflix and, you know, the only remaining blockbuster you can like rent from Airbnb and sleep in it or something like that, right? Um, And so Christensen had a consulting firm called InnoSight, where I guess they like put innovation goggles on you, um, that you could hire in to either teach you to be a disruptor or teach you to avoid being disrupted, I guess. Um, and he made a lot of money off of off of that uh, consulting group. And then, you know, we also talk about Richard Florida, who's the c- guy who created the notion of creative class. He's made a lot of money off of basically cities uh, hiring him and his firm to come in and make their 
you know, their places more appealing to hipsters and creative types who are supposed to create economic growth. And, you know, then there's like the design thinking IDEO Stanford D school folks um, who promise to make you more innovative, but don't really have any evidence for it. And I should say that part of the issue is, is Christensen's ideas actually don't hold up to like, uh, you know, social scientific analysis. This notion of disruption just doesn't hold any water. But part of, you know, so part of the, part of what we're trying to argue is that because we want innovation and because it makes profit for companies and because it makes growth for nations and governments, you know, it creates this space for people to like pl- claim they're experts to, that could give you some solution that could come and make you more innovative or, you know, make us all, you know, create more innovations and, and, you know, that's the, the, so it creates a consulting space, you know, and they have like incentives to not really be honest with us about their ideas and how effective they are. And you know, a lot of this, uh, uh, innovations, like, well, that's interesting, but you talk about the point that like innovation actually happens, but when it does happen, it usually happens like slowly and often accidentally, like serendipitously, you can't like plan for innovation. It's hard to. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm like enough of a, you know, a progressive professor, like, you know, stereotypical in that way where I'd like, I want the government to spend money on like scientific research. Cause I think that leads downstream to actual innovations that benefit our life. But, you know, like this is a place where I actually think there's a, something to like conservative and libertarian arguments where you can't really steer this stuff. Right. It's like, you can't plan it in a way. Uh, And I think that's part of the problem with these innovation consultants is they want to give you a recipe for how to produce innovation. And it just doesn't work that way. So all this time while we've been spending money on and time and energy on thinking about how to be more innovative and like those innovations that we come up with, I mean, they're not that great. Like at best we get email Slack, which can help things a little. I mean, email has helped a lot. Slack, not so much. Then you have things like the Juicero, which you talk about. Right. Right. I just said there's new Juiceros. There's one now for tortillas, like homemade tortillas. And there's one, there's like a cocktail Juicero. So instead of making your own cocktails, uh, which I think is a manly thing to do, you're you're supposed to use this, uh, you know, use this gadget to just have it do it for you. Right. Well, for those who don't know the Juicero, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a smart juicing thing where you, you have to buy these pouches with juice in, or basically kind of pulpy juice, and then the Juicero squeezes it because you push a button in your smartphone. And I guess people realize you could just squeeze the stuff out with your hands out of the pouch. Yeah, you could just cut cut the thing open with scissors and squeeze it out, and there was the machine wasn't doing that much. So, so yeah, we that innovation speaks can get you innovations like that, which aren't very useful. So all this time we've been thinking about how to be innovative. We've you make the case we've been neglecting maintenance. What do you think is going on there? Like why? Let's talk about maintenance in the first place. You make the case in the the book that maintenance is it's necessary, but it's often neglected. And this isn't new. This has been a problem for most of human history. Like how far back do we know that people have had problems with maintenance? Oh, all the way back. You know, we talked to the historian Pam Long, uh, and uh, she's a historian of like uh, the Middle Ages and the ancient world. And she says that, in Rome in like the 14th or 15th century, like it's just absolutely awful. There was no maintenance going on. Um, and so, you know, there's and there's lots of other examples of like failing sewer systems in ancient Rome and stuff. So maintenance has always been a problem, as you say. And how has it become more of a problem in the 20th and 21st centuries? There's a number of areas of life we can talk about. I mean, I think the, the kind of high theme here is that there's a lot of incentives these days for short-term thinking. So in the corporate sector, for instance, uh, there's a lot of emphasis put on the quarterly report and for producing short-term growth and you know to boost stock prices and such. Well, that is going to lead you to put a lot of emphasis on you know creating the new thing that's going to get that that extra boost. And distract you from keeping going, you know, the things that are already there. And we see the same thing in government. So our our federal infrastructure programs are aimed to get money to localities uh, to build roads and such. But then, 
there's no federal money for maintenance. And what the localities are doing is signing on to maintain those things forever, right? Or until they want to put the road to bed. And and they don't have the tax money to do that. So they have the short-term incentive to take the federal money to build the thing. That's awesome. And everyone can stand in front of it and take a pretty picture and, you know, cut a ribbon or whatever. Um, but then, you know, they're not considering the downturn, the downroad costs of it. Well, it was, so I thought an interesting point you made in the book was like at the 19th century, like the railroad tycoons, they actually kind of figured out that maintenance was an important part of their business operation. And they had to invest a lot and they actually built up an infrastructure for maintenance. And they actually, um, like maintainers, people who'd maintain that, like they, that was a kind of, not a high status, but it, it came with, it was well paid and it was, it was, it was well regarded. But then like slowly into the 20th century, like maintenance or the maintenance professions kind of were seen as dead end dead end work. What do you think happened there? Like from the 19th century to the 20th century where maintenance or being involved in maintenance work was seen as, uh, you know, like just not something, not, not something to aspire to. Yeah. Well, part of it I th- is that we look at like the status that is associated with work is part of our argument. Um, and something that happens is as technologies age, they, they go down in terms of social status. So in the 19th century, it was high status to be a mechanic or an electrician. Those were to both things that you would do as a aspiring young person who wanted to move up in the world. Well, obviously, that's not how we talk about those trades now. That's not, I'm not saying, you know, like, socially, we judge those as, like, the trades, right? And they're for people, you know, in quotation marks who aren't, you know, college material or whatever. This is not how I think about it. That's how people talk about it. And so as technologies age, the status of working on them tends to go down. And we see that actually happening with coding and um, computer work right now. Um, so they're becoming more blue collar like, um, and eventually you might not even need to go to college to do them. So I think that this is one dynamic and answer your question is as the things get older, the the status of working on them, uh, declines. Let's go back to this idea of where we're having problems with maintenance. You mentioned roads, and I thought this was really interesting because in the U.S., we're always talking about the poor state of infra- of our infrastructure. And it's always it's always sort of like a platform for both whatever politician, whatever side of the spectrum they're on. Roads are bad, bridges are cum- crumbling, and I, I mean, I really didn't understand like what what's going on there. And you, as you said before, like what happened is like the federal government subsidizes federal highways, but then passes it on to the states and the uh, local municipalities to maintain the roads. I, mean, I guess the problem is like when these local governments decide to take on these these new roads or new bridges, like why don't they think about the maintenance costs? Like why don't they think about oh we're going to get this free bridge basically, but they don't think about and then we're going to have to pay for it thirty forty years down the line. I think because they're not required to, you know, I mean, the, it's it's basically free money they're getting from the federal government or very, very low interest loans. Um, and they're not required to show that, you know, that they, they can handle the cost down the line. So the incentives are like directly aligned for them taking the money and then dealing with it later. And they won't even be in office when or around when when it becomes a problem, like twenty or thirty years down the road. Um, so I think it's about incentives ultimately. And then the other problem too is that you know, maybe they accepted the money when things were were great, but then their like tax base has been decimated because they've lost an industry. So I'm thinking like Rust Belt type places where they had all the the car industry and they thought, yeah, maybe in fifty years we'll be able to maintain it, but. Now that the industry's gone, they don't have the tax base to support the maintenance of the road anymore. Yeah, I mean, this guy Chuck Marone at Strong Towns, who's really a good person to follow on these issues, I mean, he he's shown and argues that this issue of like taking on too much, you know, too much infrastructural debt and not being able to maintain it is a problem in like normal, healthy communities. But obviously there's lots of part of lots of parts of our country that have depopulated over the last 30 or 40 years. So that becomes an even bigger problem, right? You just don't even have the tax base to keep going. Uh, then then you face really tough questions about like how to handle handle repair water systems for a municipality when there's no money, right? Uh, those are those are huge questions for our society. Well, are there places in the world that you found where they've been able to crack this maintenance? Not like were they able to keep their infrastructure? It's it's stable. It's good. It's in good working order. 
You know, it's funny. Uh, we do look at a couple places in the book. So first of all, you can look like at Japanese high-speed rail systems. They have amazing maintenance. Um, they've never had a, a deadly accident. And, uh, you know, like their average annual delay is like by a minute. The average delay over time is, is, a, is a minute. And you tell that to people on like the Northeastern corridor, uh, where, you know, they use the train to get from New York to Washington DC or whatever, they're going to cry. Um, and then we also looked at, look at like water maintenance, uh, water management systems in the Netherlands that are pretty amazing and they do a good job maintaining, um, this is how they deal with ocean water. But, you know, since the book came out, there's been a series of articles, about the canal systems in Amsterdam and how they're collapsing. So it's just like, I think you can find some cultures that are better at it in general, but there's always exceptions, you know? Apparently even the Dutch aren't good at maintaining some things. Well, so one point you make in the book is that in order to solve these maintenance issues, like when stuff's falling apart, governments, even universities, businesses, the typical solution is, okay, we're going to grow our way out of it, right? We don't have the money now. Maybe if you throw more money at it right now, get bigger, that'll solve the problem. But then you guys make this case that, well, growth, yeah, it can solve the problem, but then it just perpetuates the problems you already had before. Like how so? What's going on there? Well, I think there's two sides of it. The first side is that in a sense, our infrastructural problem comes from growth, right? Well, the, the way we use federal money to build infrastructure is a post-World War II thing. And during that time, we've grown out the suburbs in our country at an amazing rate. And so we've, we've used federal, it's almost like a bubble of sorts, you know? We've used federal money to blow, build up all this infrastructure. Now we're stuck with it. Um, so growth becomes a liability down the road. And I also think growth is just not sustainable as a strategy. It's not sustainable environmentally uh, in, in, for lots of production. But, you know, you look at universities today, they want to deal with everything um, in terms of growth. Well, every university in the nation is trying to deal with their problems via growth. And you just think about the numbers of students and how there's actually going to be declining numbers of college students over the last next decade. Not everyone's going to grow. You know, it's just, it's not realistic. So I, I think both how growth becomes a liability and is not like a realistic long-term strategy, those are the two sides that come to mind right now. Right. So as you get bigger, it's just more stuff to maintain. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's part of the history of, you know, we can think of like modern life is that. You know, we had the railroads, then we had, you know, the telephone system, and we had the electricity system, and then the, the highways and the road systems, water systems, all these things that make modern life modern life. As we have built them up over the last 150 years, they become debts and liabilities that we're accountable for. So, I mean, that's an argument for saying we really need to, if we're going to build more, we need to think about how we're going to pay for it before we do so. Yeah, and I, I've heard this phrase, like this term. I think it's part from that guy Parkinson, who's like he came with Parkinson's law, like time fills the space available or work fills the time available. He also had like some other things, like basically if an organization gets above a thousand, like most of the work at that point just goes to maintaining the organization that sounds right. and not not actually doing anything new. And yeah. you can see that, yeah, yeah, you can see that at universities. I mean, you look at all the number of deans and administrators, and they're not. Uh, it's just I mean, that's that's a problem. And there's like not much teaching going. I, I have a friend who's a professor and it's a constant, I mean, he carps about it. I get it. Oh man, it's so, so true. And you talk about like, you know, how we saddle students with like all this debt in our country. And I think there's a pretty strong argument to be made that the reason we've been raising tuition is because we've added this enormous layer of administration, you know? So we've been talking about the problems institutions have with maintenance. So governments, uh, businesses, et cetera. But we also have these same problems of maintenance on the personal level. Like where in our personal lives do we, do you, have you seen people having problems with, with maintenance? Boy, I mean, I think at home, if you're a homeowner <laughs> or renter, but especially if you're a homeowner, I think you know the realities of maintenance and how it's so easy to push it, push it off. So one of the things I did for the book is I actually bought a bought up house here in Blacksburg, Virginia, when we were working on the book. And I, I talked to a, a home inspector, you know, a guy who does inspections for sales. And he was just telling me all kinds of 
wild stories of like, you know, he climbed on, climbs on people's roofs to find if they're sound or not. And he actually fell half part way through one, like a month or two before we had talked. Um, and he said, you know, he said that the, the scariest thing he sees is when he um, goes and looks at people's decks on the back of their houses. And he says so often he just has nightmares that are, people are going to have like a family party or something. They're just going to collapse under too many people. So, I mean, I think that's, you know, we can also talk about, you know, what renters experience, but home ownership is a very clear example of where we see this kind of deferred maintenance problem. Right. Owning a car, same thing. Totally. Yeah. Totally. But even like your, like our health, right? There's a lot of like stuff we should be doing that we know we should be doing to like sort of preventative maintenance. You go get the yearly checkup to make sure you catch things early. But people are just like, yeah, especially men. They're like, yeah. I, I don't right. have to, I can just put that off. Put the beer gut on, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. okay with that. I don't have to do that. But that then again, you, you defer the cost. And then like when you're 60 or 70, you have like diabetes and all these other health issues that you could have been, you could have nipped it in the bud earlier. Yeah, like heart disease is a great example of that, right? But yeah, I mean, I mean, that's really where it touches people on the, it's funny because we write about, you know, we write about the nation, we write about organizations, we write about all these different things, but it's often like the bodily maintenance and thinking about like short-term rewards of like another cookie or another beer or whatever it is versus exercising and all the, you know, the long-term thinking, that's really where it hits people. It's like, oh yeah, like this is a, an individual level problem as well as a social society level one, right? And then also on the personal level, I mean, you guys talk about there was, a, we had it in a, a, at a time in our culture, this idea of like, you know, use it up wear it out, make do, do without, like sort of, you could fix stuff, right? If something wore out, you could, you know, your grandma would darn her socks, grandpa would fix um, the tractor. But now because stuff is so cheap, if something breaks, you're just like, well, just go get a new one, buy one on Amazon, I'll be here the next day. I don't have to worry about fixing it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, this is another part of the technological revolution of the last couple hundred years. I have a lecture um, called Modernity Equals Cheap Crap that I give in most of my classes. And it's, you know, I start the lecture with things just like falling out of people's closets or falling out of like their uh, garages. About like f- half of American garages are full, st- full, so full of stuff that they can't be used to put cars in. And, um, you know, I mean, what this is about is the cheapness of things in our lives. We, we, we don't, we take that for granted and we don't really realize how amazing it is. But as a result, it is often cheaper for you to go buy a new toaster than it is to get your toaster fixed. And of course, this has big environmental ramifications, right? Because we're just like, we become a very disposable society. Well, and the other problem too is that companies have started to make consumer goods that they're, it's harder to repair. So like, Apple, I think, is a prime example of that. It's like, if you want to replace the battery, you can't do it yourself anymore. You have to like go somewhere and have them replace the battery for you. Yeah, you know, I was kind of aware of this thing called the right to repair movement, which is fighting companies locking down uh, repair before we wrote the book. But as we wrote the book, I really became a big uh, proponent of it. Um, and so I look up to people like Kyle Wines of iFixit, the repair site, or Nathan Proctor at US Perg. Uh, these guys are really fighting to pass laws to make our stuff repairable again. Um, but it's true, it's become a corporate strategy, but from, you know, it's John Deere and some automakers and Apple and a lot of other gadget makers have like really tried to make their things not repairable so that we have to rely on them. Yeah, you go to them. And then, I mean, it also brings up, I like this kind of brings up ideas in law. Of, like, what does it mean to own something? Like, do you really own the thing if you can, if you can't fix it, if it breaks down? Are you just, are you just leasing it? I know it's, it gets weird. Like, are you licensing your phone from Apple? Um, I think this really pushes in the States. I think this, you know, this kind of upsets really deep, long held traditions of autonomy and, you know, individualism and stuff that we've kind of feel cut off from our things and that we don't have the right to repair them. That doesn't fit for us, I think. Well, uh, so we, there's the problem. We're not maintaining it. So I think part of the problem is humans are really bad at thinking about the future. Like we're, we're short-term thinkers, don't think about the long-term. This happens on the micro level, and then it, you see it happen on the macro level. 
um, you think people will get smarter uh, when you start thinking high level, but they actually get dumber. Um, but then also just the, our culture has changed. Things have gotten cheaper. Things are harder to repair. So it, we've lost this ability or this idea of, uh, of maintenance. So what can we do to get back the maintenance mindset? Like what are, what do you guys propose at the maintainers? Yeah, so we try to boil it down in the book to a, a, a couple ideas. I mean, I, I think, first of all, for organizations, it really requires leadership and realizing that this stuff is important and and, um, and valuing it up front. And then it requires a kind of cultural shift, right? Uh, we have to get better at this together, uh, especially if we're talking at the organizational level. Um, level. And then, you know, where we can, we we also need to like, you know, talk about innovation and maintenance, like actual innovation and maintenance. So in the book, we cover uh, companies that are making digital apps um, and other uh, software mostly to better manage maintenance, whether it's through predictive analytics and AI or remote sensing and stuff. There's ways we can get better both in, in infrastructural maintenance and in organizations at maintaining things. So we we don't have like a like, you know, we there's a there's another genre of book like this where you end with a um uh you know a bullet list of like policies that you'd like to see put in place, whether in government or or uh businesses. And we didn't chose not to end that way. We it's more of a inviting people to the realization that this is important and then, you know, talking and thinking together about how we can improve. Yes. Yeah, you know, ideas of like innovation, helping maintenance. I know like in the oil fields, they're using drones to like check lines to make sure there aren't any leaks. And it's all AI stuff. So they can see like, oh, there's a leak and then they can go and fix it. Yeah. We have a buddy um, named Varun who works in uh, basically predictive analytics around uh, gas leaks in you know uh, natural gas heating uh, type pipes, and it's it's you know it can use remote sensors and and algorithms now to to watch things at a distance. So there's a lot of improvements that can happen. At the same time, you know I think we're skeptical that those improvements alone are going to save us. We're in such a hole right now when it comes to infrastructure in the states that it's not going to be like. Through in it, you know, innovation alone is not going to save us. We're going to have to kind of get real about where we're at. It's a mindset, yeah, that you have yeah. to take on, right? Well, and another cultural shift that has to happen is we have to raise the status of maintenance work as well. Like instead of thinking as okay, it's a dead end job. That's where you go if you don't go to college. Actually, hey, these people are an important part of like keeping like sort of like the Mike Mike Rowe approach. These are the guys who make civil civilized life uh, possible. Yeah, and you know you can live uh, you know a pretty good middle class life in the trades. You know, I think we've just really kind of shot ourselves in the foot by assuming that you have to go to college to to have a good life. You know, we talk, that's the way a lot of people talk. It's not true. And I work in universities, right? Like it's in, it's in my interest to say, yes, come to, come to school. But, um, the trades are great. I, but I think that like you're saying, we have to rework how we value these jobs and realize that these people are important and they're, they're giving value to our lives in important ways. And I think the big takeaway that I got this from personally from your, from the book was whenever I buy something now, it's like, Okay, not only think about the cost that I had to clunk over to get the thing, I got to think about what's the cost of maintaining this thing as well. Um, and I usually don't do that, but now I've been thinking about that. And, and not just in terms of like my monetary costs, but like bandwidth costs, like where am I going to put this? Uh, what, what happens when I have to get rid of it? I mean, it's going to be a pain in the butt to get rid of if you buy some big thing. I'm starting to think about that stuff now. Well, that's great. The Andy and I had these kind of realizations as we were working on the book too. And I think... Um, you know, that's, that's where you end up is like, you know, I'm looking, we have one of these, you know, what are the, the, the kind of dehumidifiers you plug into the wall right now in our basement. And I'm thinking about buying a built-in one because for a variety of reasons to put in the basement. But now, you know, I'm doing research on like, what are the maintenance costs? What am I getting myself into here? Right. I would have never done that before before we worked on this. And also that causes you to like kind of shift away from the growth mindset and thinking, okay, more stuff is better. It's like, well, actually sometimes more, more isn't good. Right. Like, right. Yeah. More is more costly. And uh, like, like you make the example, like obesity, like getting fat, like at a certain point, like fat's good, but at a certain point it becomes costly. Yep. 
that's a great way to think about it. So yeah, just pare down. It makes maintenance a lot easier. Um, so where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? The easiest way to, place to go is the maintainers.org. Um, and we have a email list serve. People can join there. It's a, it's not too many emails and it's a fun group. And then they can also just reach out to me. I'm Lee at the maintainers.org, uh, or Andy's Andy at the maintainers.org. I'm also on Twitter at STS, uh, underscore news. Fantastic. Well, Lee Vinsel, thanks so much time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, man. This was fun. My guest today was Lee Vinsel. He's the co-author of the book, The Innovation Delusion. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Find out more information about his work at the website, themaintainers.org. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash maintenance, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.